Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. Hello, Michael. How, Hi, how great to see you, as always. How are you on this fine and sunny Monday? I'm really well, actually. I'm very much enjoying the weather. I, I had a little trip out in my camper van last week oh. and I'm going to have another one with a bit of luck this week. So, oh. yeah, I'm really trying to make the most of it. Now, I... I... I just have to ask, Michael, because I think last time you were out in your camper van, I had one of the best text messages I've ever had from you, which <laughs> said something like, yeah, call you in 20 minutes. I've just got to return my canoe. <laughs> yeah. Will this yeah, be I've... involved this time, the canoe? I'm not sure. I'm going to try a new place. I've not quite decided where I'm going to go. OK. okay. I, I like, yeah, I'm on this kind of constant search for like my perfect campsites. Yeah. Mm. I've got I've got like a whole Google Maps list. You know, you can create lists oh, you've within told Google me about Maps. This. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, yeah. It's you know, and I share it with other camper vanners. Oh see. I know. Sure. I'm such a geek, aren't I? Think. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds really great. Now Fee, we've got a bit of a, a theme developing. Last month we had the Khalil Gibran poem on marriage, obviously famous Lebanese poet. And this month we've got uh, another poet from the Middle East. Um, it's an Iraqi poet, not somebody I'd heard of. Please forgive me, any Arabic speakers, for my pronunciation. The poet is Nazik al Malaika, and the poem is Love Song for Words. A new one on me, Fiona. And a new one on me, Michael. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's lovely because it's one of those conversations where you and I weren't able to be there. And um, it, it's so exciting when we go to the treasure trove of the audio um, pot and you and Ben, who is our fantastic editor, pull out some glorious bit of audio that I haven't even heard or been involved with and um, just have the pleasure of discovery, both in terms of the poet for me and the poem and the wonderful insights of the guest. Yeah, I completely agree, Fiona. There's something really nice, isn't there, about hearing other people have the conversation rather than having to listen back to ourselves. <laughs> uh, and in this case, it's Andrea Vitsky slott and Al Snell uh, who are uh, sitting in for us and doing the most fantastic job. This was recorded towards the end of April last year, uh, April 2021. So we were coming out of, of lockdown, as you'll hear in the conversation. But there's something really... I really enjoyed being reminded through the conversation of some of the things that we sort of felt we'd learnt and discovered during lockdown. Uh, and, and it was just really great to be reminded of that. Absolutely, Michael. I completely agree. So you'll be hearing Al and Andrea talking about Love Song for Words, the poem that's been a friend to Mariam. I suppose the first thing we'd like you to do is tell us what your poem is and uh, read it for us, if, if you don't mind. Um, so I chose a poem called Love Song for Words and it's by an Iraqi poet called uh, Nazik al Malaika. She really is um, quite incredible and I chose this particular one because it's almost like an ode to words. And she was the first Arabic poet to use free verse and she kind of was the pioneer of that. I've also got the first little part in Arabic if you'd like me to just read that bit as well. Would love that. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll read the English first. Why do we fear words when they have been rose-palmed hands Fragrant, passing gently over our cheeks, and glasses of heartening wine sipped one summer by thirsty lips. Why do we fear words when among them are words like unseen bells, whose echo announces in our troubled lives the coming of a period of enchanted dawn, drenched in love and life? So why do we fear words? We took pleasure in silence, we became still, Fearing the secret might part our lips. We thought that in words laid an unseen rule, crouching, hidden by the letters from the ear of time. 
We shackled the thirsty letters. We forbade them to spread the night for us as a cushion dripping with music, dreams and warm cups. Why do we fear words? Among them are words of smooth sweetness, whose letters have drawn the warmth of hope from two lips, and others that, rejoicing in pleasure, have waded through momentary joy with two drunk eyes. Words poetry tenderly turn to caress our cheeks, sounds that, asleep in their echo, lies a rich colour, a rustling, a secret ardour, a hidden longing. Why do we fear words? If their thorns have once wounded us, then they have also wrapped their arms around our necks and shed their sweet scent upon our desires. If their letters have pierced us and their face turned callously from us, then they have also left us with their ode in our hands and tomorrow they will shower us with life. So pour us two full glasses of words. Tomorrow we will build ourselves a dream nest of words, high with ivy trailing from its letters. We will nourish its buds with poetry and water its flowers with words. We will build a balcony for the timid rose with pillars made of words and a cool hall flooded with deep shade guarded by words. Our life we have dedicated as a prayer. To whom will we pray but to words? And I'll just read the first uh, part in Arabic because it's so long, I won't read it all in Arabic. Um, Kalimat <laughs> وهي أحيانا كؤوس من رحيق من عاشي رشفته ذات صيف شفة في عطشي. Absolutely beautiful. So well, you were translating it back to Arabic, were you? So it's originally Arabic and I read the translation in English. I believe it was Rebecca Carroll Johnson who translated her, her work, but the original poem is Arabic, yeah. Have you read the original, Mariam? Yes, yeah, so I've read the original in Arabic, but for me, I understand it well. However, I feel like I need to read the English to completely understand it, if that makes any sense. So I, I love yeah. the way it flows in Arabic, but I, I think she's done such a great job of translating it because she's managed to keep like the beauty of it and, and kind of a bit of the rhythm to it. But um, the Arabic just feels more melodic almost. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So when did you first come across this poem? When did it become a friend to you? I think, you know what, it's not actually been a friend to me for a very long time. So I I came across it about a year and a half ago. One of my friends sent it to me and I was really blown away by the just the language and how passionate she is about words. I just think her work is really stunning. It was just sent to you, so you read it. You didn't hear yeah, it? Or? No, I didn't hear it. It was sent to me. Uh, one of my friends sent it as a huge text. And I was like, oh, my God, this is beautiful. Like, who wrote this? And she was like, oh, it's it's an Iraqi poet. And so I, I love to write poetry. So she thought of me and I just thought, oh, I've, I've never really heard of her. So my parents are Iraqi and I've not really looked into Iraqi poetry that much. So that really introduced me to it. I was like, wow, it's beautiful. Quite nice that a friend sent it to you too. Yeah, and it became a friend. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What was the poem doing that spoke to you? I think this year has been particularly difficult for everyone. And I think poetry has been that solace for people. And it's that way to feel like, oh, you feel the same way as me. Like it's that kind of shared connection with the world. And I think for me, the fact that she kind of talks about words being so loving and gentle and despite the fact that they can be so hurtful she's kind of tried to alchemize that experience and make it into a beautiful experience it just reminds me that words are so powerful and it really like infuses me with almost like a new kind of zest for writing and poetry and just giving me that voice again yeah it's it's interesting you you mentioned this year 
Marianne, mm. because it seems so apt, you know, that this line, we, we took pleasure in silence. Mm. I'm wondering if it, you know, as the year went on, whether this poem has become even more sort of important to you. Definitely. I think initially, I think we all collectively went through a phase of feeling so overburdened that it's almost like it was a survival mechanism to kind of shut down because it was just so overbearing. Like even our nervous systems probably felt so heightened that we kind of just became more subdued. I just remember when um, initially, like there were so many events on Zoom and there were poetry events and it felt so taxing. <laughs> and I know that sounds really strange, but I just didn't find the words like I would rather be silent. So with this poem, it's almost like it's just thrown a bit of life into my spirit almost. And it's just given me that hope that there are words beyond this and there are ways that this can be uh, turned into a beautiful experience. It doesn't have to be so painful and so silent. And although I know for me, silence has also been very sacred, I now understand that we definitely need both. <laughs> Why, why do we fear words? What, what do you think she means by fearing words? Mm. What is there to be frightened of? I can't answer on her behalf, of course, but for me, I fear them because I'm afraid of not having a response or not having the response I pray for. And for me personally, if I was to say something to someone I love or to someone close to me and I feel as though I didn't get that right response or the one that I was kind of yearning for, I think that's where my fear is embedded in those words. It's quite scary in a way, isn't it? You know, sort of voicing what we feel. It's easier in some ways to be silent. So I, I feel like there is something about the, the poem is reminding us, yes, why do we fear words? Why do we fear words? You know, acknowledging that fear, but then pushing elsewhere into what words can do and um, and ultimately ending with prayer. So so I guess I, I, I'm just curious what you see the words doing from that point, the fearing words onward. How does she take it into another realm where we don't have to fear and censor ourselves anymore? Yeah, I feel like she almost takes it on a journey. So she kind of begins with a lot of the language is quite sensual, you know, the heartening wine, the caress on the cheeks. And it's it's that feeling of intimacy. And perhaps that also makes us feel afraid. So I feel like she's taken that journey. And then she's almost said, I know it can really hurt you. But it can also be those arms that wrap around your neck. And then she kind of says, you can take that and with your oud, which is a like a, it looks a bit like a guitar and it's played quite commonly in the Middle East. And she's saying, you know, take those and make yourself a melody. So there's a lot of like alchemizing in it. It's, it's not saying words are always pure and beautiful and, and that they're always going to save you. It's not really got that kind of false perception of words are like your heroes. They're actually more just so close and sometimes dreamy and sometimes beautiful but also sometimes very painful and what I love at the end is she says like I think it's a rose yeah she says we build a balcony for the timid rose and it's like that that kind of delicate part of you that feels afraid of being vulnerable and you're protecting it with those words and I feel like she's created this kind of dream nest house to pray to and we kind of use poetry to come back to, like it's almost a form of worship. So I love the fact that she's mentioned prayer because prayer feels like a dignified way of desiring something, of, of, of writing to God. It's an unusual poem too. I mean, if we counted how many times the, the word words is used. Yeah. And the irony is it's words. That we're afraid of. So there's this sort of hall of mirrors too. 
So her first poem was called Cholera, and it was about the cholera spread in Egypt and Iraq. She moved to Egypt after Saddam was in power. And so she wrote the poem Cholera, and it was in free verse style. And her family were kind of like, oh, my God, what are you doing? Like, this is not going to do well. This isn't typical Arabic poetry. And she was like, you just watch. This is going to change Arabic poetry. And it did. And I can't help but feel as though this is her way of saying, I am going to write in free verse and I'm not afraid. And it's just it's just so liberating to see. It's interesting you say she left Iraq at that time, because I suppose there's another element to the danger of, mm, of speaking out. Definitely, definitely. Very much safer to, to keep quiet and yeah. because you don't know who's listening or how it might be interpreted. Absolutely. And I know a lot of poets decided to stay because they were being paid well or they would write for certain companies. But for her, it was always about being authentic. And she was very passionate about women's rights and being able to use her voice. So she moved to Egypt. She actually also studied in America. I, I feel for her because to want to speak out about something or to want to write in a certain way and have to hide it constantly is so punishing. So this is almost like her telling herself to speak those words that are so rich and so beautiful that she wants to speak about. Yes, and I, I love the confidence at the end, you know, so pour us two full glasses of words. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, let's, yeah. let's celebrate it. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the idea that it's self-talk too, saying mm. I got to do this and I've got to do it for me. And that word authentic that you mentioned, her authentic self, I think is particularly powerful. How do you see that word authentic as playing into your life and the, the, the friendship of this poem? I haven't thought of that about this poem in particular, which it's bizarre what you come out with. It's almost like a stream of consciousness when you're speaking about something you love. You're like, oh, authentic. Um, I think the fear is really about being seen for who I am. And when she says, why do we fear words? I can't help but relate it to all the ways I want to be, but I could be restricting it because of fear of failure or fear of not being seen for who I want to be. So it's almost like a catch-22. It's like you want to be seen, but you're afraid of how you're going to be seen. But actually, it's just so much more important to live authentically. And you invite authentic feelings too. And I feel like that's what she draws from this. Actually, it just struck me as how beautiful that is. It's a love song for words. How is it a love song? <laughs> how is it a love song? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think because it has all the qualities of, of what love can feel like. It has the pain. It has the feeling of going into silence and sadness. It has that sense of calling you back it has that that hope as well so it, it's funny you say that because sometimes I forget I'm like oh yeah it's called why do we fear words and I'm like oh no it's not and it just it does <laughs> um it's... that would be a completely different poem wouldn't it if that was what was highlighted why do we fear words exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly so it's a love song for words but it's also a love song for herself to to be more authentic to be who she wants to be and who she needs to be. And did you say you read it for the first time during lockdown? Uh, so no, it was just before lockdown. But I think during lockdown, I was reminded of it a lot more. Like before, I would kind of look at it maybe more romantically and just be like, oh, this is so beautiful. And the, the way she's used this particular language is so dreamy. But now it's like, oh, no, I think it's not just dreamy. I think it, it, it's a stronger calling. It's it's about being authentic and, and being seen. Oh, it's such a strange time, isn't it? Because lockdown is beginning to lift. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like just this little sort of like lid is lifting and, and we're told you can go out, but... 
I'm not so sure I want to sometimes. I don't know. Mm. But I, I know I need to want to. What are you hoping the message and the power of this poem gives you as we begin to enter, hopefully, uh, this new spring of ours? Yeah, for sure. I think there will definitely be challenges with that. Um, and I think it's just important to remind ourselves that perhaps we've all been on so many little journeys throughout this pandemic. Just experiencing a pandemic in itself is is so traumatic almost. Um, and then also people having their own personal traumas. I really do pray that we come back in a much more compassionate way and that we are, since we've been able to sit with ourselves or hopefully we've had the courage to sit with ourselves and our emotions, that we could be those people that provide better space for our loved ones and for our friends and not be so afraid of the silences or the, you know, the withdrawn friend or the friend that is overcoming anxiety or whatever it is I think because we've had so much time to reflect and and unfortunately ruminate as well we can really lend that compassion to other people I feel like it's maybe because the nature of meeting will be a little different hopefully we have something else now and we've removed almost a veil between us because we're kind of not afraid of that awkwardness that sometimes we feel. Marianne, do you think this poem is going to be a lifelong friend? I think so. Um, It could be a friend that I'm fascinated with and then maybe drifts off, or it could be something that I'll always look back and and appreciate and love. So I don't know why I I answered that, but that's what felt authentic in that moment. (laughs) Love song for words. Why do we fear words when they have been rose-palmed hands, fragrant, passing gently over our cheeks? and glasses of heartening wine sipped one summer by thirsty lips. Why do we fear words when among them are words like unseen bells whose echo announces in our troubled lives the coming of a period of enchanted dawn drenched in love and life? So why do we fear words? We took pleasure in silence. We became still fearing the secret might part our lips. We thought that in words laid an unseen ghoul, crouching, hidden by the letters from the ear of time. We shackled the thirsty letters. We forbade them to spread the night for us as a cushion, dripping with music, dreams and warm cups. Why do we fear words? Among them are words of smooth sweetness, whose letters have drawn the warmth of hope from two lips, and others that, rejoicing in pleasure, have waded through momentary joy with two drunk eyes. Words, poetry, tenderly turn to caress our cheeks. Sounds that asleep in their echo lies a rich colour, a rustling, a secret ardour, a hidden longing. Why do we fear words? If their thorns have once wounded us, then they have also wrapped their arms around our necks and shed their sweet scent upon our desires. If their letters have pierced us and their face turned callously from us, then they have also left us with an ood in our hands, and tomorrow they will shower us with life. So pour us two full glasses of words. Tomorrow we will build ourselves a dream nest of words, high with ivy trailing from its letters. We will nourish its buds with poetry and water its flowers with words. We will build a balcony for the timid rose with pillars made of words and a cool hall flooded with deep shade guarded by words. Our life we have dedicated as a prayer. To whom will we pray but 
to words. That was Andrea and Al with the gift reading at the end there in another echo of, uh, of last month's episode. Uh, our thanks, of course, to Mariam for giving us permission to use this conversation. And our thanks to the estate of Nazik Al Malaika and Rebecca Carroll Johnson, who did the fantastic translation. Well, such a great discovery for me. And particularly in the light of Mariam's wonderful insights about the poem, the poet, the Arabic, the English, the free verse, everything. It's just a a really rich um, and beautiful way to be introduced to this poet's work. So, Michael, having been so excited by this discovery, I've been doing a bit of research and also found that there is a a new uh, collection with an overview of Nazik Al-Malaika's work celebrating her amazing contributions and that's published by Saki Books and I'm going to be getting a copy of that for myself so I thought I'd mention it in case anybody else feels they're going to go there. I've got a couple of things to mention as well, actually, Faye. Uh, one, one of which you know about. Um, you very kindly bought me Paul Henry's new collection, As If to Sing, which I uh, got round to starting a couple of days ago. And your suggestion to me was to read it from the start, to read it sequentially. So I'm, I've dutifully followed that. I'm very much enjoying. I will take it away with me in my van. Uh, tomorrow hopefully and and continue with it because it's really there's something very special about it so yeah um, that's Paul Henry as if to sing who's that published by Fee? That's Saren Books. Very good coincidentally whilst we're in the Middle East um, when I had Covid and I had to miss a week from the play the director of the play sent me uh, a copy of uh, a Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. It's called The Butterfly's Burden, translated by Fadi Judah. I'm sure I'm not saying that very well. Uh, and it's published by Blood Axe. Uh, so I've been enjoying that very much uh, as well. Great. Fantastic book recommendations, Michael. That's wonderful. Now, we should also tell people that coming up in the next month, we're going to be out and about in Coventry at the Skylines Festival, uh, which is a wonderful looking three or four days, what is it, 15th to the 17th of July. Amazing programme um, being put together by Nine Arches Press and others. And we're going to be there on Sunday the 17th with a conversation in person with an audience with the fantastic Rishi Dastadar and the wonderful Ros Goddard. So if you're in, about or near Coventry, do come along and find us, not to mention the other astonishing lineup that there is there over the weekend. And if you aren't in that vicinity, you can also engage with many of the events through a live stream ticket, uh, which you can get online. Will people be able to get a live stream ticket to see the thing that we're doing, for? They will. And that ticket will also get them into lots of other things. Oh, I see. So uh, presumably there's a Skylines Festival website. That would be the place to go? That would indeed. Skylines. Excellent. I look forward to that. I'm a bit nervous we've not done that for a while, have we? I know. Not with the live stream business going on. (laughs) Exactly. That would be fun. I rely on Ben, our wonderful editor. I know. He makes it sound good, right? I know. I guess it just remains to say we'll be back next month with more Poems as Friends, both in Coventry and here with the podcast. Thank you for listening. Mm